I thought today I would just sort of talk with all of us about a subject I never once heard addressed while I was at Dallas Seminary. Someday I'm going to write a book on things they never told me while I was going through school because they are often the things that seem to occupy so much of our time and attention when we're engaged in ministry. And the subject uh, I have in mind today has to do with what is written about in the 15th chapter of Acts, the last several verses of that chapter, between two missionary journeys and between two uh, missionary seasoned uh, missionary statesmen, we would call them, Paul and Barnabas. Uh, As soon as I say that, uh, everyone on the platform and most of you here in the uh, 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 chapel know that I'm referring to the disagreement that occurred between these two fine men. Uh, Now, I'll be honest with you to give you something of an idea of my idealism. When I graduated from Dallas Seminary, uh, it was almost beyond my imagination to think that two Godly individuals could strongly disagree. Uh, And I I really did believe that if the Spirit of God is at work in both lives and uh, the Lord is the one who wants us to have a relationship that is harmonious and uh, kind toward one another, the whole idea of a sharp disagreement seemed impossible to me. However, I have been engaged in the work long enough to know that um, you you cannot work closely together over a lengthy period of time and have an honest relationship with each other without occasionally having times when you disagree. Hopefully, you can do it without becoming disagreeable, though I'm not confident that this disagreement was solved in a, in, in a way that uh, these two men were pleased with. It did lead to good things in the days ahead, and that, of course, is the way it is, uh, based on Romans 8.28. But at the time, it was anything but agreeable, harmonious, or even kind. There was a harsh, sharp, Disagreement between these two godly men. Let me read the passage for us and then just make some comments and then apply it. I'm looking at Acts 15, 36. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaimed the word of the Lord And see how they are. And Barnabas was desirous of taking John, called Mark, along with them also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along, who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, Strengthening the churches. Uh, Let me uh, preface my comments on the text itself by making several comments regarding situations like this. First is that disagreements are inevitable. If you're going to have a relationship with one another that is based on truth, reality... Vulnerability, the kind of honesty where you are free to express yourself with each other, there will be disagreements. 
Opinions and viewpoints will differ, even among the godly, even as both are filled with the Spirit. Disagreements are inevitable. And second, obviously, with that in mind, even the godly will disagree. Uh, Each time I come to Dallas Seminary Chapel, I I find myself feeling uh, uh, especially uh, privileged to, to be on the platform with the men and women that I respect so much and with so many of you whom I know. Uh, And there are times that I have to sort of pinch myself to believe that I could be numbered among you and to be respected by and loved by you. And I I mean that with all my heart. I certainly have those feelings for each one of you. And uh, today I'm especially warmed to think that we could have this... um, Congeniality, is there such a word? There, this sense of togetherness. And so it's hard for me to imagine these people disagreeing with each other. But I know that they do. I, I, I know that they do. And there are, there are moments where I would disagree with one of them or with one of you. And our respect would not uh, be trashed. Uh, We wouldn't from then on see one another as an enemy, but we have an honest, open discussion about something, and we just disagree on it. We just can't come to terms with it. Now, the third thing I want to say is that uh, uh, in every disagreement, there are two ingredients. Two ingredients, at least two. Number one, there is an issue. An issue that involves principles And secondly, there are viewpoints, and the viewpoints involve personalities. Issues related to principles, and that's where we form our convictions. Hopefully, uh, we leave this school with some very firm and stubborn convictions that nothing will change. We also, however, will maintain a viewpoint about something because of the way we're put together. My dad used to refer to people's put together. His put together is different than your put together. So because we have that true among us, there will be disagreements. We see things differently. Dr. Bob Cook, the late Dr. Bob Cook, put it so well. God reserves the right to use people who disagree with me. It's a great comment. I have seen God greatly use people I could not work with. And I respect them and I love them and I appreciate their giftedness. I just couldn't work with them. We can't have agreement uh, to the level that we need in order to work in harmony with each other. That's the reason on every church staff there are people who are relieved from the staff. Hopefully it's done well, honorably. And graciously, but you can't work together. I've had the experience more times than I don't want to remember where I've walked into someone's office and and closed the door behind me and we've had a talk that has been under control, quiet, thankfully. And uh, I've I've had some say, thank you. In fact, I had one man say, you should have done this a year ago (laughs) because I don't fit. The, the ministry as it's going in, in this direction. I, I thank you for doing what I wasn't, you know, honest to myself enough to do. I wish they were all like that because there are others who, who left in a storm. And, and some uh, do not feel kindly toward me uh, because I, I made that hard decision. So it's a, the, the uh, godly will disagree and there will be differing diff, uh, uh, viewpoints and there will be differing uh, issues uh, at stake. Number four. In many disagreements, many disagreements, each side has very valid points. And in the heat of the disagreement, it's hard for us to honor and acknowledge the value of the other point of view. Because we are so uh, fixed in uh, our opinion and, and our viewpoint. Okay. Maybe good for you to stop for a moment and think of the last disagreement you had with someone. 
I did that just an hour ago as I was putting the final touches on this talk. I, 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 I thought of a, of a disagreement. Uh, I kind of had a choice. I, I have had several. Uh, I, uh, one was with my wife, and you know how those are. And uh, it's none of your business what it was about, <laughs> but, but it, was a, it was a disagreement. We love each other dearly, been with each other 54 years as husband and wife, and absolutely uh, would die for one another. Our love is deep and profound, and it is, uh, I believe, uh, uh, it is unconditional. But we disagree. And I remembered, I remembered one, of those disagree- one of those disagreements. I remembered. I had a choice of several. Then I have a friend with whom I disagreed recently on something, and we didn't part ways. We just agreed to disagree. And thankfully, we weren't disagreeable in that. So you think about your situation, and as you hear these words I share, maybe you're, you're going to blend that or weave that into the situation you've just come out of. So this is the hopefully will, will help you. What we've got here is, a, is two strong men both of whom any one of us would love to have worked, and, and both of whom, each of whom, we deeply admire. Now, the history of it goes back to chapter 13, if you'll turn back there. On the first journey, Paul and Barnabas travel together, having left Antioch. They make the journey, and uh, verse 5 of uh, chapter 13 tells us, When they reached Salamis, they're on Cyprus, when they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And Luke adds, they also had John as their helper. Now, Luke is not yet in the group, so he refers to they, not we. He's not in the group until chapter 16. So probably gets his information from Paul. And uh, they have John as their helper. John is a, is a young Jewish convert, reared in Jerusalem, a godly mother who even had the church in her home and a great prayer meeting that ties in with Peter's uh, uh, life at the, at the time. John has seen God at work. God has been reared. Uh, John has been reared well. This is the John Mark that wrote the gospel. This is, a, this is young John Mark. So think of yourself as a young, perhaps older teenager or in your early 20s, and they've got John Mark with them who is traveling as their helper. He's not a spokesman. He's, uh, he's helping them. He's helping carry the stuff. He's helping with the work that's involved in a journey this rugged. Now they get verse 13, uh, Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos, and they came to Perga in Pamphylia. You check the terrain and the geography. It starts getting really tough, as is true in every missionary trip. There are moments that don't look like the pictures that you had looked at earlier before you took the journey. Now we come to a mountain range. Now we come to a rugged shoreline. Quite likely, the insects are, are, are uh, swarming, And maybe at this time, Paul falls sick, and there's some discouragement among the even the two older men and John, we read. John left them and returned to Jerusalem. End of explanation. We so wish we had further information. Did he talk about it? Did he leave in the middle of the night? Did they discuss his struggle? Uh, One man is so practical, he even says, as an aside, uh, the boy got homesick. I don't know how he knew that, but it's a possibility. Uh, I'm sure that was part of it. When you're young and you're that far away from home, I had a man write me who found himself um, at at the tip of Africa. And uh, it happened to be Robbie Zacharias. And Robbie said, as he stood there and watched the oceans collide, he said, I don't think I've ever felt so far from home as at that moment. He was away from his wife, and all of us have had that experience, not there necessarily, but you are in a place, and it's not as you expected, and in the midst of the uh, unexpected, 
something happens. And when you're young, in a hurried moment, you quit. Unless you're unusual and have great fortitude, you walk away, you you leave. Now, when you get to chapter 15, I'm sorry, yes, 15, we've got the seasoned missionaries following the Jerusalem Council. Paul is led of God to revisit the brethren in the places where they had been, verse 36 tells us. And he wants to see how they are. Great idea. Everything good about the plan. Missionary journey number two is about to begin. Luke records Barnabas was desirous of taking John, called Mark, along with him also. He's the one who had defected. That's a harsh word, but that's the way Paul would see it. You don't see it here, but you do see it in Colossians 4.10 that Mark and Barnabas are cousins. Keep that in mind. Barnabas has probably had time to visit. He's the older of the two, and he's visited with John, John Mark. And uh, he uh, has had time to see the changes in his growth. He's watched him mature some over the months. He's encouraged with the words of John, as he has said, I... I so regret uh, walking out on you. I, I, I look back on it, and if I had it to do over, of course I wouldn't, and said all the right things. And so, so Barnabas says, and, and it's an imperfect tense here, the way Luke writes it, verse 37. He, he's, he's, he's staying with his position. He's, he's saying we need to take John Mark. We need to give him a second chance. Let's do that. Uh, and Paul kept insisting they should not take him. Let the text unfold as it reads and linger over it with a little imagination. What you have here is the issue. Remember I said earlier, there are two things. Here is the issue. Should a man who defected be given a second chance? Maybe add to it this early in his life. Should he be given more time to mature? Whatever the reason was, John had left them at a time they needed him the most. The toughest days of that first journey were ahead of them, and he was gone. They didn't have him as a helper. Paul remembers it. Barnabas is now desirous, and so he stands his ground saying to Paul, No, 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 you're too harsh. The young man needs a second chance. So there are different viewpoints. Uh, Paul keeps on insisting. The argument, I take it, is lengthy. Barnabas is looking at the man. Paul is looking at the principle more than the man. And it, it makes no difference why he left Barnabas. The fact is, he left us. And he left us when we really needed him. And I've seen his type before, he may have added. Guys like that don't change that quickly. Maybe even tossed in a verse of scripture. That often helps. (laughs) Confidence in an unfaithful man in a time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. As Solomon wrote, he may have said. (laughs) I'm sure Barnabas could come back with his verse to justify the grace in his heart. Now... What interests me is verse 39. Spent more time on that verse than any of the others. There arose such a sharp disagreement. Okay, let's pause there. Paroxysmos is the term. It's the word from which which we get our word paroxysm. Listen to several brighter minds than mine identify the word. The quarrel was heated, writes one man. It was a major disagreement, writes another. F.F. Bruce, 
a provocation, a sharp disagreement. C.K. Barrett writes, there was a sharp dissension. The disagreement was sharp. Exactly how sharp, it is not easy to say. The Septuagint carries the sense of to provoke, to irritate, to enrage. Same term. The conflict has strong emotional qualities to it. The, the conflict does. Same root word is used to describe Paul's reaction to the idols that he saw in Athens. His spirit was so provoked by what he saw in the multiplicity of idols, as he writes of it, or as he refers to it in Luke's writing in Acts 18. Daryl Bach, in a rather thorough work on this word, writes this. There arises a major contention between Paul and Barnabas. The term paroxysmos, when used negatively, describes anger, irritation, or exasperation in a disagreement. This is a major disagreement, writes Bach. Here is an example where a disagreement was so great, the ability to work side by side was affected. I would love to tell you and comfort you with a statement right now that you will never know such sharp disagreements. That this was all in those days, but they're, they're over today. Tragic. Hard as it is to hear it, uh, it isn't true. You will. You will have sharp disagreements. If these two men had it, you will have them as well. And there will be all kind of jockeying for positions. Uh, one man put together a creative argument that may have gone like this. Paul, John Mark, we can't take him. He failed us last time, Barnabas, but that was the last time. Paul, he's likely to fail us again. He's a deserter. He said, time to think it over. We've got to give him another chance. He's got the makings of a great missionary. Tell me, Barnabas, isn't it because he's your cousin you want to take him again? Thrust, twist. That's not fair, Barnabas responds. You know, I've tried to help many people who aren't related to me. I'm convinced this lad needs understanding and encouragement. He could be a great evangelist someday. We need someone who can stand up to persecution, an angry mob, beatings, perhaps jail. Our team has been close-knit, thoroughly reliable. How can we trust a lad who failed like John Mark has failed? No, Barnabas. Recall the words of the master. No man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. I told you, he'd have a verse. It works. I've talked to him about his failure. I'm sure he won't defect again. To refuse him might do spiritual damage. At the moment of his repentance, it would be like breaking a bruised reed, like quenching smoking flax. It's too soon to trust him, says Paul. Paul, remember soon after your conversion, I took a chance with you. The apostles were afraid of you, thinking you were faking your conversion in order to infiltrate the church. I didn't make you prove yourself first. I'd rather not keep John Mark waiting. I vouch for him now. That's how it went, perhaps. Well, they couldn't come to an agreement. Verse 39 concludes they separated from one another Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus Paul chose Silas and departed being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord let's um, address briefly a solution then I'm going to apply it further uh, there is no reconciliation because both sides could be supported. You're already taking sides, I would imagine. I find myself doing that as well. A.T. Robertson captures the scene beautifully. 
No one can rightly blame Barnabas for giving his cousin John Mark a second chance, nor Paul for fearing to risk him again. One's judgment may go with Paul, but one's heart goes with Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas parted in anger and both in sorrow. Paul owed more to Barnabas than any other man. Barnabas was leaving the greatest spirit of the time, perhaps of all times. They separated, severed all contact. You never mention it there, working again together. Handed to Paul later in his ministry, he asked for Mark to come. In fact, in his last letter, on his last words, he says to Timothy, come before winter, bring Mark with you. Mentions even that he's profitable to me for ministry. So Paul came around. Thank the Lord for the passing of time and a little bit of wisdom that comes with age. So what do we say? Well, I think there are four lessons. Let me see if I can limit it to that. Number one, when in disagreement, work hard at seeing both viewpoints, not just your own. And a good passage to refer to while you find yourself in a lingering disagreement is Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Look not only at your, we would say today, your own viewpoint, but the viewpoint of another. Do your best in the midst of a disagreement to see the other viewpoint. Second, when both sides have good support, and they usually will, seek a wise compromise. A man named Flynn suggests this compromise. Listen to this. Could Paul or Barnabas or both have developed a reasonable compromise? Giving in would not have meant heresy, for no doctrine was involved here. Could Paul have said... We'll tell him he's on probation. If he doesn't work out the first month, we'll send him home again. Or perhaps Barnabas could have conceded, we do need dedicated workers on the team. Let's give Mark a minor assignment to see how he does. In the meantime, we'll start our journey, and if we hear he's measuring up, we'll send for him to join us along the way. Couldn't they have agreed on a contingent plan? Um, I, I, I need to warn you that it is easy when you were trained in a very conservative school and you are taught by very strong-hearted, uh, careful students of the scriptures using the teaching is the very word of God. It is easy to leave feeling you have the answers at every point. What you forget is that not everyone you're going to work with has gone through this school, has been taught by these who hold to these convictions, and see this exactly as you see it. You need wisdom as you're dealing with those different kinds of personalities. And rather than blaming them because they didn't go to Dallas Seminary, or criticizing them because they don't have the convictions you have, realize they're coming from a different point of view and they could very well support it just as firmly as you can support yours. We're not, I, I noticed that uh, in, in the passing of years, as I've learned the hard way to work with people, I, I've had folks say to me, uh, we didn't think you'd ever come around or that you'd ever be big enough to admit that uh, we, had a, we had a point. Uh, how come it is that so many Dallas Seminary graduates are so stubborn in their convictions? That's a great question. What they're concerned with is the way we go about disagreeing. People who respect us don't, uh, don't expect us necessarily to turn and agree with them at every point, but they do expect courtesy, and they do deserve that. A sense of grace in dealing with those that are from another point of view. So sometimes a wise compromise is the best way to go. And it is not a mark of weakness. Certainly not uh, giving in to your principles. You're working on the relationship as well as, as the principle at stake. Here's the third. If the conflict persists, 
care enough to work it through rather than stomp out. If the conflict persists, care enough to work it through rather than just stomp out. Determine now that you will never slam the phone down on anybody. You will not slam a phone down on anybody. That is an insult to the person you've been talking to. Uh, Determine, and this is especially helpful in a marriage, that you won't give the person the silent treatment. Man, we can do that. We may not verbalize it, but we just don't talk for a day and a half. We eat in silence and we go to bed side by side, but back to back. Uh, Don't let the sun go down on that kind of wrath. Maybe you had every reason to be angry and we're commanded to be angry, however, not to sin. Uh, And for sure, guard against taking shots behind the back of the person you've had the disagreement with. Christians can be the worst in the area of gossip. Uh, I formed the habit in, in more recent years of when I start hearing that kind of stuff, saying to the person, may I quote you? May I quote you to other people? And even when I see this person again, may I quote you to that person? Boy, it's amazing. The gift of backpedaling kicks in right away. <laughs> well, why would you say that to that person? I, first of all, I can't resolve your conflict. I may make it worse because I'll be tempted to take your point of view because you will convince me. Be careful about taking shots behind the other person's back. Fourth, and I do mean it finally, if it cannot be resolved, graciously agree to disagree. And sometime even agree to separate. Agree that we cannot work together agree that there cannot be an ongoing relationship uh, between you and your co-worker, and you, you say that that's it. We've worked at this long enough to know that we're not going to resolve it, so we will agree to disagree. If it's any help for you, just as the second missionary journey became very successful, Sometimes a separation uh, is used of God in a magnificent way to uh, spawn another realm of ministry. How many schools began because of a sharp disagreement with the uh, mother school? The original place where the group was working together. And in the, in, in the heat of the battle, determined the people determined, we can't keep working together. And another school is formed some distance away. Uh, I I want you to also guard against the disagreement leading to your starting another church down the street. If you have a disagreement with a pastor or a staff and God has gifted you and with that has come a following of people... uh, Don't yield to the temptation of listening to the people who follow you that just a few blocks away there's an empty building and it's available and we can start our own stuff down there. Check out the ethics of that. Check your heart. Would that be right? Would that serve the body of Christ? If you are man or woman enough to disagree and to separate, then get some miles between you And those individuals, if you plan to begin another work, starting it back to back is a dirty pool. I was uh, serving uh, alongside another individual many years ago. And uh, there was a, uh, in that particular church, there was a growing group of people who were in disagreement with the way the church was going. And for some reason, they thought I would be a much better answer than the one who was serving as the man I was answerable to. And uh, one, I'll never forget it, one uh, evening, these, uh, several of these people came over to visit with us. And they said to Cynthia and me, okay, 
we got a surprise for you. And uh, close your eyes. So I closed my eyes. And, and we heard paper crinkling. And the next thing we knew, a bag was put over our heads. Never been kidnapped before. And so uh, we, they walked, marched us out. I said, don't peek, don't look. So they got in the back of the car and we drove and drove and drove. I've never told this story before, so bear with me here. We got there, and uh, door opened. Okay, hop out. We got out, walked over. Didn't know where we were. Okay, they walked me over here and said, okay, stand right there. All right. Bag came off. I find myself in an empty, abandoned church, standing behind a little lectern. And they said, this will start our new church. We got everything. We got a preacher, got a pulpit, got a building. And I broke my heart. In fact, I used it as an opportunity as we sat around a circle that night. I said, man, I, I know you, you really are concerned. But I want you to know this is not the right thing to do. If there's a disagreement, this is not the way to solve it. Don't, let's not do this. Let's don't go there. First of all, I would never do this. And second, you, you need to really check your heart. Because um, if you're going to deal with a disagreement, just moving a few miles away and continuing on uh, is, is not the way to go about it. You... Uh, you owe it to yourselves and you owe it to the man that I serve and honor to uh, work it out with him. And I'm not available to do this. I don't know if you'll ever be in a situation anywhere near that, but learn from that experience. Thank the Lord I handled that one right. I wish all my stories ended that well. I have not been nearly that heroic all through my life. And I have succumbed to gossip. I have succumbed to saying things behind people's backs. I have not resolved every conflict wisely, which makes this passage all the more meaningful. You know, when I thought about this message, last Sunday night, our children's choir sang, and they sang the Christmas program. It was beautiful. And one of the lines was the, Lines from the angels, and all the little angels were standing this tall. They were great. Their little halos. One put hers on backwards. Another one, it just one fell off the platform. That's the cutest thing. They were all up there. Fallen angels. And, uh, <laughs> and out of their mouths came peace on earth among those with whom God is pleased. Keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Do that. It's part of your calling. Okay? We need the Spirit of God to enable us to do that. Father, thank you for um, a few words of counsel uh, for all of us. They may apply to a home where there is a conflict with a husband or a wife. They certainly do apply in relationships, maybe at work where some of these men and women are uh, fulfilling their responsibility and their occupation. They can occur in a school where there is a disagreement with fellow classmates. So uh, we pray that you would fall in a fresh way upon us with a reminder that uh, this is Christianity.